Welcome to week three of Musical Conversations. Our first two weeks of concerts have been emotional and unforgettable. After a year of silence in the concert hall, it feels like we're taking a warm bath in beautiful sound. Our first guest today is pianist and composer Matan Porat. Matan was born in Israel and lives in Berlin now. We're very lucky that he's able to get to Portland this summer because of COVID restrictions. Few artists from Europe have been able to get visas. Matan is one of the most staggeringly multi-talented musicians you'll ever meet. This week, he's going to improvise the soundtrack to several Buster Keaton silent films, Sherlock Jr., The Playhouse, and The General. And he's also going to play with the Dover String Quartet, his world premiere of his piano quintet. You have had quite an ordeal to try to get here from Europe. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about this? I, I think I'm one of the few artists from Europe who made it to the States this summer. I know lots of my colleagues uh, were denied visas and uh, nobody got the uh, NIE status. Uh, so I think I, I'm kind of lucky. Let's hope everything goes well from now, but it should be fine, yeah. And so how do you think you were able to get it as opposed to so, so many other people? I don't know. I got many, I got many artist visas in the past, so maybe that's why, uh, yeah. Well, we are very lucky because I know so many festivals around the US, they had to change their plans and couldn't have the originally scheduled artists. So you're going to be playing two films at the beginning of your stay here in Portland, um, improvising the soundtrack to two evenings of Buster Keaton films. What is that experience like playing? Is it just like playing another concert of, of music that you know, Brahms Piano Quartet, or is it a just completely different experience? Completely different experience. Uh, first of all, uh, it's very much um, uh, improvisation, so it's uh, audience uh, make a, a difference, the ambient makes a difference for me, um, the venue, everything has a factor in a way because I'm not playing from written music and I'm making uh, things uh, basically from scratch except of light motifs and, and so on. Um, so, uh, and of course, uh, I'm, I'm more, uh, both more relaxed and needs to be more focused on the, on, on another end. Um, but I'm going to do two, uh, two evenings of very different movies. Uh, in the second evening, I'm going to do the general, a film I've done many, many times. On the other hand, on the first uh, night, I'm going to do uh, both by, um, Sherlock Jr., a wonderful, wonderful, uh, my favorite Buster Keaton movie, paired with uh, The Playhouse, a movie I never done before. So I'm also excited about it. The, uh, for, so the general you said you've done around 15 times, something like that, is, has it settled on, have you settled on certain motifs, themes, structure, or is it quite different each time? It's very different each time, but there are uh, light motifs that I remember, like for the hero, for, uh, you know, uh, the south against the north, so, so they are like main motives that are being explored. But for instance, uh, entire sequences where he runs on the train that goes on for 20 minutes, this is, I have no idea what's going to happen and what I'm going to do. So a lot of things are very much fresh every time. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. And it's, I mean, it's not like a lot of improvisation where you can you can extend it or you can shorten it. I mean, you just, your length is predetermined. Right? Well, the length is predetermined, but nothing else is predetermined. So, so it's very, um, it, it, it requires me to be on my toes the whole time. And I like it. <laughs> Amazing. 
I mean, playing chamber music with other people is also you know, keeping, keeping you on your toes all the time. And does it feel a little bit like that? Like you're interacting with you're the movie or, or somebody? Yes, very much so. On the other hand, uh, the input needs to be always from the movie in, in one hand, but I'm the only musician. So it does feel like a solo. On the other hand, it does feel always like an accompaniment. So it's a weird mix between solo and accompaniment the whole time. Wow. Yeah. So, and then later in the week, there will be the world premiere of your piano quintet. Yes. Very, very exciting. I, it, it was always a kind of uh, my wish because I'm playing uh, my, I think the most, uh, uh, the most common uh, uh, chamber setting that I'm playing uh from outside would be with a string quartet so i'm i'm playing a lot a lot of uh, uh of piano quintets and my my wish as a composer since like 20 years was to write a piano quintet and uh, i'm very very happy and thankful that you commissioned uh, you commissioned this because it's really something that i had in mind for many many years some commissions um the commissioner will ask a composer for a specific instrumental combination right, mm -hmm. for one reason or another. But in yeah. this case, I remember asking you, what would you like to do? And you were the Thank one. You for that. <laughs> well, I, I think it was so it was interesting. We and I think you settled on piano quintet pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. like to do that. It turns out that you're going to you will play and you will be playing with the Dover Quartet, who are old friends of yours. Yes, that's um, make, so, they already played a piece of mine commissioned by them, uh, a string quartet, and they were wonderful, of course. Uh, so I, I think it will be a great combination. And so you knew from, I, I believe we established from the beginning that you would be playing with the Dovers. Mm -hmm. Does that, um, shape what you write? Uh, it does shape very much uh, the, the notion that uh, it's a fixed ensemble uh, because uh, this in this music it's very much piano against quartet and not against a violin and cello and viola. Uh, it's one ensemble that is fixed that knows each other and play together the whole time uh, uh, in combination with myself. And that's why it's, it was very important, you know, that's not just like, um, uh, you know, in a festival where people don't know each other and they just meet for the first time. Uh, and this was very, uh, when I knew that's for the Dover Quartet and that's for a quartet that is very, very much also known by playing together, by doing, uh, you know, so, so much uh, uh, this kind of music making. I knew that I have to write something special that uh, combine the two forces uh, and not just a dialogue between five instruments. You will see, you will hear the piece, uh, but in a way it's um, continuation of the tradition, the traditional piano quintet repertoire. It's very, very much, uh, uh, although uh, rhythmic and metric, it doesn't always line up. And there are some uh, very, very much uh, 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 metric uh, uh, disassociations. But it's a very traditional piece in a way. It's three movements. There's a scherzo, there's a slow movement. The first movement is even a sonata form, although it's a very, very weird one. But um, in a way, uh, and this was also important for me as a pianist, this is a very, uh, it, it has a lot of dialogue with, with uh, both uh, Baroque and, ba uh, but um, very much in the Brahms uh, direction. 
does your composition sound quite different from your improvisation? Yes. Well, I mean, also my improvisation, uh, different styles and movies sound completely different, as you probably know. Um, you remember uh, when I did the, the battleship Potemkin and uh, Lake Champlain, your other festival, um, this, I was looking for something Russian at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and last week I did a, in a festival in Lille, I played Cembalo for a, a, um, a French horror movie. And this was completely modern, it was completely contemporary music combined with some Renaissance. So um, the improvisation styles are very varied in a way. And my compositions are in another direction. Once upon a time, a few hundred years ago, it seemed like uh, many or most of the composers were the very accomplished or the, in, in some cases, the great instrumentalists of their time. Yeah. And we've, there's become a little bit more of a divide seems like there, there are composers and there are performers who are more specializing. You are, however, one that falls into that old tradition. You are a, a great pianist who is a composer. Do you think that that shapes your music? Um, you, know, you imagine yourself playing it, or are you writing also for other pianists to play your music? Yes, actually, I, I don't like uh, so much to play my own music, to be honest. I'm never pushing to play my own music in my own recitals or my concerts and, and, and so on. Um, in, in a way, it's even hard for me to, to play a chamber piece because then I'm concentrated uh, on the piano music. I'm, I'm a pianist after all. Uh, and if I'm, if I'm sitting outside and listening to a group playing a piece of mine, then I have a much more objective look and, and feel from outside. So um, on the other hand, uh, I, I have, uh, it's one, one, less, uh, one less of a player to worry about knowing the piece. So <laughs> at least this helps a little bit when I know what I'm, I'm, I was looking for. Uh, but I'm not writing for myself necessarily. Have you ever had a pianist play your piece and it sounds just completely different from how you imagined it, how you would play it? Yes, of course. But a lot of times it's, it's, it's great. Uh, 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 this year, uh, Roman Rabinovich played uh, a, a new piece of mine, which I played, and he played it very differently, but wonderfully, and I loved how he played it. Uh, um, and uh, I have this, um, I have these experiences many times. So uh, I think when 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 you have great artists and great people playing. Uh, it uh, brings a new life and new light that you were never thinking about to, to your own pieces. Do you think that would shape the way you play it in the future? Um, that's an interesting question, but uh, uh, it, it does change my perception on the, the particular piece because it adds, to, adds another facet to, to it that I was not thinking about. It's amazing. It, it's like a, a living, breathing thing. Exactly. exactly. Once, I, once the, the music is completed, it's not mine anymore. I mean, I, I wrote it, but it's mine as, as much as it's the other person. That is a really amazing perspective. I wonder, I, I don't think every composer feels like that though, right? Do you think Beethoven didn't feel like that? Do you think? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course, but it's just uh, when I come up across pieces that I, I wrote 20 years ago, for instance, it looks both very foreign to me, but also very 
uh, charming because it's something I, of me, something I know, but it's not what I what I did yesterday or today. So improvisation and th this uh, movie nights that we are doing. Uh, What's nice about it is that this is the where uh, me as a pianist and me as a composer meet in a way, um, because uh, this is something that is really the, the combination of, of my two personalities. And uh, that's, I think, I, I, when I discovered that I can do this, uh, it was very ful fulfilling because it's really uh, the two things I do. So I, I love it, yeah. Week three is a piano lover's feast as virtuoso Marc-Andre Hamlin will also join us for two of the most riveting works of the summer festival. Some of you may remember that he performed for our virtual season last December, Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring for two pianos with my wife and co-director Gloria. They'll team up again this week in Bartok's exciting Sonata for two pianos and percussion. He also will play Leo Ornstein's massive but little-known quintet with the Dover String Quartet. Oh my god, uh, Leo Ornstein. Uh, he's a composer who many people will not have heard of. But uh, at one point in America, at, uh, I would say maybe in the teens and 20s you know he really was all the rage I mean, he was a very active performing pianist playing the best to classic and romantic literature and uh, at some point and, and he was also composing uh, relatively conservative things tonally and at some point in his 20s, he started hearing very, very, very strange harmonies and felt compelled to, to write this stuff down. And the, uh, he, uh, the, the, a lot of these uh, compositions were not only very dissonant, but very violent as well. And uh, it got so that um, he started to doubt his sanity. But he was really, really acting out of a, a genuine impulse to a creative impulse to write these things down. And uh, there's one famous uh, piece of his called Danse Sauvage, uh, Wild Men's Dance, which is about, it's just under three minutes long, but it's almost nothing but ferociously packed uh, um, writing uh, of tone clusters, of chromatic clusters. And uh, it's it's one of the, really one of the most violent pieces you ever heard. And, uh, uh, some people encouraged him. Some people thought he was nuts, uh, but but he uh, he continued that way for a while. But I think in his heart he he basically remained a romantic. And uh, in 1927, he came out with what I think is probably his greatest piece, and that's the piano quintet that we're going to feature in the festival. Uh, it's very hard to define it stylistically. I mean, one hears great romanticism. One hears. Uh, Bartokian barbarism. Um, it's got a very, very strong uh, rhythmic framework, although it tends to uh, sort of change tempi all the time, and, and, the, and the mood changes are uh, very, very frequent. And uh, and um, I think that uh, that's probably the most difficult thing about it for uh, rehearsal purposes. And, and you know this because we've actually done it together in another um, uh, occasion. Uh, the constant changes of tempo are really, really hard to get used to. But uh, once you get to know the piece, I mean, uh, you're really in the presence of something very great, I think. There are huge spots of the piece where the tempo changes feel like get faster, okay, let's get a little faster, and now let's get even faster. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and one thing about it is that um, you know, the, 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 the piano writing has lots of, uh, well, let's say it, lots of notes. And um, it's extremely ornate. Uh, and uh, because the tempi were often fast, you need a, a real virtuoso of a page turner. <laughs> because uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, 
the music is so dense and there's so much activity that it's preferable that the page turner remains standing up in places. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the Bartok barbarism. And originally our idea for this program was to have the Ornstein on the first half and have the Bartok Sonata for two pianos percussion on the second half. And, and basically, well, that would have been too bad. Oh, well, it would have been just like the most thrilling rock concert energy. Uh, <laughs> I agree. On that. And so you will also play the Bartok later in the week. So we'll, we'll make both concerts really exciting. Um, but something that struck me with the Ornstein when playing it with you before was also how many styles of the time he seemed to absorb. Yep. I, I, I felt like, I, I mean, even in my memory, some Stravinsky, some Rachmaninoff, some Ives. Um, is that something that strikes you as well? Oh, very much so. I mean, it, it, his uh, impulses were just pure intuition. Uh, and uh, he, um, he said something very interesting about his piano quintet in particular. He said, whatever one could say about it, it is what I heard. So he wasn't a systematic uh, composer. Uh, he, he didn't really have a set of Schoenbergian rules, for example, to it, that he adhered to. I mean, it was just pure inspiration. And the Bartok for me is, it's one of his most enjoyable, exciting, immersive pieces um, to mm -hmm. listen to it's, and it and it feels big and uh, but doesn't take up as much length and as much space as it feels like yeah. it's very very condensed potent um, it has the the rhythmic the atmospheric the, the folk elements the virtuosic which i always associate with bartok's piano writing um, what do you look forward to most about playing this? Well, this is, uh, it'll be uh, very nice to revisit it because I actually haven't played it that often, but I really got enthusiastic for the piece and listened to it many, 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 many times before I even got a score, before I could even afford a score as a, <laughs> as a student. Uh, and uh, it was many years after that until I, I even played it. Um, and uh, it's really, really not an easy piece. Uh, first of all, pianistically, uh, even though Bartok was a good pianist, a very good pianist actually, uh, underdocumented, I think, or underappreciated, uh, the, the writing doesn't particularly lay that well under the fingers. And uh, the, the, there's a lot of sort of figuring out to be, uh, to be done. I don't know about his string writing, uh, whether he played the, the violin or not, you know, but uh, I, I know that the, the piano writing really is a tough nut to crack, to crack at times. And um, also the piece itself is not terribly easy to put together. I mean, it, it's much easier if you already know how it goes, because the first movement is largely, uh, if not completely, in... Uh, in nine eight, you know, to be technical, sort of the ta da da ta da da ta da da the nine, uh, so three beats per bar. But it's he subdivides it into some. Sometimes it's not three three three. It's it's uh, I, I don't know two four and three or three and two and four or something like that. And um, sometimes not all instruments at the same time have the same subdivision of this nine. You know so. Uh, you really, really have to listen to each other and um, get over the initial confusion that the, this kind of thing may cause. But once you got it, and once you uh, get the groove of it, it I, I remember my last performance of it as, as being pretty exciting, and I'm uh, eager to uh, rekindle my relationship with the piece. And I think a, a very attractive feature of it is that it's, it's very colorful. Uh, he exploits the... Uh, possibilities of these few percussion instruments uh, really, really uh, in great detail and uh, gets as much out of them as, as he can. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because sometimes when I close my eyes in a concert of this, I swear I can hear an orchestra. It's, it's really kind of staggering how, how he's able to get that. Like he even gets those, those fantastic creepy string sounds, the, the night music that, that he'll get in his symphonic works. Um, 
uh, really, that represent the movie The Shining for us, for so many of us. It's the first thing we think of because of that creepy soundtrack. Um, but he's able to do that with essentially percussion instruments, with two pianos and all these percussion instruments. Uh, and uh, that really, including right at the opening of the piece. That when I hear you're playing, I just hear, I appreciate the pieces you're playing so much more, even more than it's not just you I'm hearing, but you're like this beautiful, um, transparent, transparent filter. <laughs> but I, I I'll take, I'll take you know, it. The, the music, the music just kind of shines right through you. And I hear the brilliance of the writing. Well, that's, that's really very nice. I, I mean, I, I can tell you that I, I'm, I'm not on the stage for me. I mean, I'm I'm on the stage for the, for the, the the hearer, the the listener, the audience. I mean, what 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 else? What other reason could you be there for? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I want you to have the experience of the music, you know, in any uh, in the best way I can. I know how to channel it to you. That's it, really. Our final guest today is Brian Lee, who is second violinist of the Dover String Quartet. The Dovers first came to Chamber Music Northwest as one of our protege artists, just as Gloria did. I had the privilege of being Brian's teacher for a few years when he was a teenager, and you can imagine what a proud teacher I am. We talked about the recent Dover Quartet documentary called Strings Attached, and of the role of a second violinist in a string quartet. We have a very special connection going back many years, um, which is that you studied with me. And I got, I had the privilege of working with you um, even before college. Did you start at Curtis when you were 18? Uh, I started Curtis when I was about 16, 17. Oh, wow, you were really young. So yeah. I think you were about 12 or 13 when we first started working together. Right, yeah. that sounds right. Never did I imagine at the time, I mean, not, not just with you, but any young student that they would go on to have this massive career. And it's really amazing. So proud of you. Um, Thanks. I mean, did you ever imagine at the time? Oh, no way. <laughs> I mean, never, yeah, definitely not. Couldn't have uh, pictured it ending up the way it did right now, for sure not. Well, what year were you in school when the quartet started playing together? Uh, so the quartet started in around 2008. So that was my um, fourth year at Curtis, actually. Oh, it was so it was near the end. Yeah, um, and actually Curtis was quite um, flexible with the quartet that uh, they gave us basically an extra year to stay at school to sort of um, keep playing together. So when you started, the four of you, did you have already intention of being uh, continuing to play beyond school? Yeah, well, we started playing together in 2008 and um, those conversations didn't really happen until maybe six months after we had formed, you know, the more serious relationship talk conversations. Um, but yeah, it, it always felt like it was um, more serious than a typical student group from the beginning. And what was the reason for that? I, I guess, I don't know. I. There were maybe a couple of things. Well, first, I think we, we had a lot of encouragement from uh, some of our coaches, chamber music coaches at school. Um, uh, Shmuel Ashkenazi being one who was particularly encouraging from the beginning, who kind of told us that, uh, you know, you guys could maybe think about getting married. <laughs> so that was always, it's always nice to hear that from somebody like from, you know, of his stature. This is Shmuel Ashkenazi, the first violinist of the Vermeer Quartet, um, one of the great, great quartets uh, of the world. Getting married to three other people. I'm not sure that 
I'm not sure whether that's more exciting or um, more daunting. I think we were uh, we benefited from the uh, you know the naiveness of being young <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> But no, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was such an exciting time. I felt at that, uh, like thinking back on that time. You're a basketball fan. Yeah. And, um, I often equate string quartet with, uh, teams, you know, sports teams. Have you ever thought of it that way? Yeah. I mean, it's totally a team. Uh, everything has to be, um, everyone has to be working together in order for the, the unit to sort of function at to its highest level, I think. So you're the second violinist. What position are you on the court? Ooh, that's a good question. There's part of me that wants to say point guard, actually. Um, not because I think it's like the most like important part. I mean, every part is super crucial. Um, but I feel like as second violinist, you have to sort of be on your toes all the time and switch roles constantly like you're playing the melody you're playing um with the viola as an inner voice um you know with the cello like providing a bass line sort of um so i feel like you have to be sort of like a chameleon in a lot of ways and fulfill many different roles and i think a point guard well it has to be a versatile point guard um maybe someone like magic johnson yeah i think point guard is Point guard is probably probably good. I definitely think of the cellist as the center. Right. Right. For the, sure, like grounding everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, blocking shots and rebounding as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Dover Quartet documentary uh, came out uh, last year, last summer, called Strings Attached, and we actually showed it as part of our Chamber of Music Northwest season. Um, for those of our audience who haven't seen it, I really recommend it. Um, I knew the Dover Quartet for, I've known the Dover Quartet for many years, but it was still incredibly enlightening. And uh, how long was the crew, that was the camera crew with you? Um, I think for the better part of two years on and off, but yeah. Wow, so they really, almost like they captured um, a whole journey. I'm sure that the quartet kind of evolved over two years. Right, and also um, we got to really know the director and the cameraman quite well through those two years as well. So it was uh, quite a journey. So what was it like watching it when it was all done? <laughs> it was um, pretty emotional. Um, you know, I don't really like watching or hearing myself speak. <laughs> um, but yeah, kind of reliving all those moments and um, yeah, reliving all of the sort of ups and downs of the quartet. Um, it was definitely an emotional experience. And um, I can't say that I would want to watch the film more than once, <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad we did it, definitely. Were you surprised with what it looked like from the outside? Yeah, well, because we didn't, the quartet didn't have any say in like the direction of how the film would go. That was all up to Bruce, the director. Um, and I knew he, that he would create some sort of narrative to go with it. Um, yeah, but it felt like a really um, sort of cohesive story that sort of went somewhere. Um, yeah, I was genuinely surprised and uh, pleasantly surprised, I'll say. <laughs> There's a lot of amazing playing, of course, in it. But one of the big takeaways that I got was that um, you, the quartet and, and your director, cast no illusions about how glamorous quartet life is. They really captured, I think, how, how much you have to endure and overcome in order to make this music that you're all devoted to. I mean, you're just, you seem exhausted at so many points. Yeah, I mean, it's, he really captured the 
grueling aspects of touring. Um, and that's also one of the nice things of having a director who wasn't really in music. And so he kind of had a complete outsider's perspective of um, the quartet, basically. Um, so yeah, there was no like varnishing of um, the lifestyle at all. And it's, uh, yeah, there like the, there's the scene where Camden is showing us in the car at like three in the morning, driving somewhere for a concert that afternoon. It's, I mean, that happens all the time. And it's, yeah, that's one of the, um, I wouldn't say it's a great thing about the quartet, but it's, it's part of the job, you know? Wow. I'm sure you probably, pre-pandemic, you were probably gone at least 75% of the year, I would imagine. Yeah, um, actually from doing taxes. And so we can see like exactly how many <laughs> days we're gone from the year. And I think it, over the past five to six years, we were averaging like 240 to 250 days, like touring out of the year. Wow. And then, and I'll bet a lot of the days that you were not touring were also together. Yeah, either rehearsing or traveling. You're right, right. It's not just the concerts. <laughs> So then the pandemic came and all of a sudden you are not together so much, right? Um, what was that experience like? Because the, the quartet is, seems like it's been going at, at full speed for many years now. And, um, and suddenly you're at home not seeing each other. What was that? How, how did that feel? Yeah, well, I think in some ways it was a silver lining for us, the pandemic being like forcing us to take time off actually. And I think the it was the longest stretch that we had gone without seeing each other, playing with each other uh, since we had formed basically. Uh, I think the, the stretch was maybe four or five months that we just didn't see each other at all. Um, and I think it was sort of needed in some ways um, just because of, you know, the grueling aspects of touring, um, it's really easy, I think, to suffer from burnout. Um, and I think that it was a nice sort of, um, it's not an excuse, but it was a nice sort of like, it was a forced hiatus in a way. What was the first rehearsal back like? I think, yeah, we were all sort of nervous, like how it would feel and how things would gel the first rehearsal, but um, it actually felt pretty good from what I remember. The first thing that we played together was harp, Beethoven's harp uh, quartet. Um, yeah, and it actually felt pretty good from what I remembered. So you, you came back together playing wise, it felt like you came back together pretty quickly, even after all those months. Yeah, I mean, there were some probably some rough edges, but it was kind of like, you know, like riding a bike, you kind of get into the groove again. I'd say like over the course of the pandemic, I've just become a lot more in tune with my emotional state. And in some ways, I think that might translate over to maybe more emotional playing. And I think that that's the case for a lot of musicians um, that because so many of us are going at such a, a frenetic pace and to have that time to reflect is so important to what we do if we are, as you said, um, conveying emotion. So, uh, you know, we're going through, we just had our first week of, first week and a half of concerts um, here in Portland, and they've been very, very emotional concerts. You know, every everybody's feelings combined. So uh, it's been really wonderful in strings attached, what I was surprised by was how open you were with your, some of the things you've experienced, your feelings. Um, I mean, you, you said a lot of things, personal things that I think I would have been very self-conscious saying on camera. And uh, it seemed so easy for you. Was, was that something that you had to prepare for, that you had to make yourself do it, or you just felt comfortable speaking to the world? Um, yeah, it's, well, I don't feel comfortable generally talking about 
a lot of personal things. I think gener like I'm a pretty introverted person by nature, but um, like I kind of uh, brought up before, like we got to know the director really well. And at a certain point, he just kind of felt like a really close friend and almost like family basically. Um, so I, I, that would that definitely helped like in terms of uh, being comfortable on camera and kind of opening up. Um, and I think also just the fact that we were uh, filming the documentary, it gave us all a chance to sort of take a step back and, um, I don't know, assess like, why, why are we doing what we're doing? I don't know, it made me sort of question like a, a lot about myself. So in that way, I felt like it helped me to open up and talk about maybe more personal things. We're looking forward to being back in Portland. It's been two years since the last time we were there. And it's, you know, we've been going every summer since 2013. So it's, um, uh, last year was sort of an aberration, but it's, yeah, it's going to feel amazing to be back. Thank you for joining us for week three of Musical Conversations. Please join us in the concert hall and online for our historic summer festival.